okay, picture this. You're a German bomber pilot in the early years of the Second World War. Your unstoppable military machine has knocked out the Netherlands and France and Belgium and all these little countries, pushed them out of the way, and the only people left are the British. You're flying over the island at night. It's dark. There's probably no moon and you're about to drop about a ton of bombs on an on a fearful populace. You want to bring them down to their knees uh, when all of a sudden from behind you, you hear the thud and explosion of cannon shells as they hit your aircraft. And the next thing you know, your engines are on fire and your crew is bailing out. And all you can think of is, okay, I'm not going to do the German accent, all right? But all you can think is, damn, those, those carrots are really good. And the reason you're thinking this is the British press has been putting out stories about how good their night fighter pilots are because they've been overindulging their love for carrots. And, and that's why they're able to shoot down so many German aircraft at night. And of course, the real reason, and this is the fact, the real reason uh, was because the British had sort of invented and operationalized radar uh, and they were able to use radar to detect planes coming in at night and use something called AI, airborne intercept, uh, because that's what AI stood for then, airborne intercept radar to guide their fighters to those incoming bombers and, and help shoot them down. So they had to cover for that. They had to cover for the fact that they had this, this piece of electronic wizardry and um, the story goes that the British Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, yes, the same Ministry of Information and Broadcasting that we have one of now. And so you can bl blame the British, by the way, for a whole other bunch of problems that we have. But anyway, coming back to this, so the British Ministry of Information and Broadcasting put out press releases and spoke to the press and said, you know, our boys love their carrots. And so they're able to, to kind of see the fighters at night, uh, see the bombers at night, and, and they guide their fighters up and they can shoot the bombers down. And so the next thing you know, you know, there was press and propaganda and lots of communication about how, oh my goodness, the, the fighter pilots are, are loving their carrots. And hey, if you want your eye, eyesight to get better, uh, you know, you've got to kind of overindulge on carrots as well. And so that turned into a sort of myth and legend uh, that billions of parents uh, in the years since the end of the war have been um, telling their kids to get them to please, please, please lay off the chips and eat something reasonably healthy right but carrots are done carrots are done carrots are carrots are old old news because today we live in the age of the superfood right and that's that's where i'm going with this with this fact you didn't need to know um the fact that that carrots are good for you uh, was was propaganda and fake news and i'm going to circle around to that to that phrase we live in the age of superfoods like i was saying there isn't a minute that goes by right uh, as you scroll your your insta feed or your or your facebook or your twitter somebody is pushing the latest miracle food and and it's it's great it's full of vitamins whatever it is it's full of proteins if you need them fats if you need them they're definitely not full of carbohydrates though we know carbohydrates will never be a superfood tara and um, antioxidants because you don't want oxidants you want antioxidants and i'm guessing back in the war the, if, if the british had if british propaganda had gotten gotten hold of this whole antioxidant story they'd have come up with something like you know oxidants cause accidents so get your antioxidants or some rubbish like that right propaganda by the way is really good at coming up with these sort of one-liners <coughs> <Swachh Bharat. coughs> that aside you know so so you've got all these superfoods and we live in an age where you can't miss out on a superfood right have you tried this because this is the real deal right now for the next four days and four days later somebody else will come up with something and and you'll hear about this amazing new superfood that's even newer and even new, more amazing and even more antioxidants and one day they're going to come up with an antioxidant that has food in it or something i don't know maybe that's where we're, that's where human evolution is headed to the ultimate antioxidant uh, i don't know what antioxidants do frankly and and i've heard so many uh, really superb sort of explanations of what it is that they do but frankly i couldn't care less but i want to also kind of take a step back uh, and talk about the original superfood and the original superfood was created by a man whose name is now synonymous with breakfast cereals and i said breakfast cereals and a name popped into your head so yes that's who i'm talking about that guy that surname that brand you see on every second conflict box across the world probably uh, or more that dude right and he invented conflicts as a superfood 
as a morning superfood and and why so john as was his first name john was was the sort of man who believed that an excess of anything uh was was very bad for uh one's moral stature and uh, uh one's sort of not just physical health but also m- moral health and uh, spiritual health i guess he's the sort of uh, chap who would probably walk up to two kids having a bit of a kiss behind a bush and say you know lecture them on the perils of endangering their culture he was probably that sort of guy i don't know maybe he was maybe he wasn't but and he truly believed unhealthy thoughts and i'm doing big air quotes over here because when i say unhealthy right now i'm specifically talk about one very specific kind of unhealthy thought all right so unhealthy thoughts in the morning or really at any time of day were deeply deeply uh, immoral and uh, he deeply believed that celibacy was the way to kind of perfect your uh, standing as a human being or i i don't know man i don't know what these guys believe honestly i mean some of it is just amazing so anyway so so he said look if you feel all this heat in your body and if you feel all this uh, all these needs desires and urges which really no evolved being should feel what you need to do is is really damp it down you've got to you've got to bring it down you've got to bring those urges because it's bad enough to live with those urges or to how should i put this to fulfill those urges with another individual but what's truly awful in john's view was um fulfilling those urges by yourself he truly believed that was that was probably the worst thing a uh, uh, an evolved human could do right so he he believed that uh, meats and rich flavored food increase that sort of desire and plain foods tasteless foods uh you know foods with less energy in them less flavor in them they sort of reduced that desire and so he decided to create a range of plain tasting breakfast foods that would damp down on our baser urges first thing in the morning and help us all evolve uh into higher beings really right and so that was that was his big contribution to human civilization the idea of conflicts and so now i kind of understand why you know conflicts just don't cut it as a breakfast anymore you want more stuff in your cereal right now who really eats conflicts anymore i mean you have for the more sort of masochistically minded you've got wheat flakes and bran flakes uh, you've got all sorts of mueslis you've got uh, i mean you've also got the whole sort of sugar bomb vibe happening and so you know we've really defeated uh, john's purpose over here uh, because finally man shall not live by cereal alone but with every urge you know that nature has endowed him with and so and so that's really where the that first superfood started and uh, that's how it's ended up right now but but the lesson here is that the idea of a superfood a was born out of one person's conviction and resulted in the creation of a let's not to put it to finally a brand and the brand has pushed the idea even further until it has become an entire category an entire industry of course dairy couldn't be left behind dairy got in on onto the act so the whole idea of not just superfood but a super meal right breakfast is the meal of the day and and i'm going to i'm going to invite you all to research this but but the whole idea of breakfast as the most important ne- meal of the day started out as a marketing initiative and so now let's go back to the superfoods we're talking about today right let's go back to all these amazing superfoods let's talk about the idea of blueberries for example like berries right uh, back in 1992 the main wild blueberry commission commissioned a study amazingly um, blueberries were found to be a superfood rich in antioxidants <laughs> so surprise surprise so that's how blueberries got their start and then you then you had kale and then you had uh, there, there was so- soybeans at some point the idea of soy um as a plant superfood quinoa is is really big right now and i'm going to tell you the sad story of quinoa right now right so quinoa is a native staple crop of the indigenous people of the high andes mountains all right so peru bolivia and uh, so you know uh, it was a it was the, their staple crop it was their version of wheat or rice uh, the mesoamericans of course had corn which would be the aztecs and and the rest of them the Ma- uh, maya and stuff so quinoa when it grew uh, in the high andes right there was an entire system so they had the llamas the local animals and their organic matter manure 
would fertilize these farms and and the quinoa grew with a certain kind of uh, system where the land would lie fallow for a certain amount of time you know so it, it went through these cycles and there were years and years and years of of uh, uh, i think it was first domesticated about 5000 years ago and so it it just really kind of was a was a core part of their civilization and then when the spaniards came about 500 years ago when the colonizers came um they they tapped down on it because a uh, it it wasn't the sort of thing they were used to eating b quinoa had a strong cultural connection with the religion uh, with the cultural practices of uh, the natives the spanish wanted to obviously break that down and so they kind of really tamped down on the growth of quinoa so there were a few distant indigenous communities that kind of kept it kept the growth of quinoa alive uh, otherwise they they kind of moved to growing corn uh this happened and then politics happened right so uh the cold war started and bolivia as was as most of south america was a sort of playing ground for the superpowers and i'm not going to really get into the politics here uh, but if you are interested you must check out uh, for example there is it is still the playing ground of colonial powers and you you must look at what is happening in bolivia today with evo morales and his return and the coup against him and and all of that so leaving that aside so so the americans have come in and they want bolivia to not turn communist and they would like to figure out a way to keep the indigenous people sort of well fed and prosperous and sort of help run this country so that people don't have the time to pick up their guns and start a revolution so they started putting in this enormous amount of aid into the country to help boost the local farmers for example so what what happened is they started pushing these local farmers also to adopt large scale production techniques for things like quinoa as well to to help them kind of grow these these uh, crops to to do better to do to be economically more well off and therefore to not kind of revolt and so the farmers i i won't get into the success of how that farming worked out and how the whole thing happened but fair you know fair to say that that the farmers started producing a lot more quinoa and so at one point it was probably around uh, 500 or dollars a ton for quinoa and then suddenly it it went to about 800 to 1300 dollars right and it exploded all right and and at the same time the the markets were looking for new and interesting foods to kind of brand and and to market really uh and and so they picked up on quinoa and suddenly quinoa was being pushed as this amazing super healthy super food it wasn't exactly a grain i know i said it, it was like their their wheat and and rice but it wasn't exactly a grain it's a it's it's slightly different it's a pseudo grain uh, and suddenly the, a whole range of health benefits were found obviously uh, and everybody wanted in on the action and amazingly so the farmers over there suddenly started like doing away with their whole with the llamas and the lying fallow and and the whole traditional system that had been built up over 5000 years and they just started treating it like a cash crop which it is now it's a cash crop right it's growing in india as well by the way as a cash crop and suddenly uh, it wasn't being the land the system the culture it wasn't being respected the way it had been and i don't mean this in some sort of wishy washy way look indigenous systems have been built up over the thousands of years that they've been built up because that's how it works right uh, it's trial and error over centuries and entire populations have de- depended on certain foods uh, as a result of that trial trial and error long story short quinoa is a cash crop in bolivia the place where it was first domes- domesticated the farmers are selling off every every ounce of it that they can grow there is actually less quinoa being eaten by these farmers today than at any point in the last 500 years because they just not growing any for themselves so the civilization that first domesticated quinoa that domesticated this superfood doesn't really eat too much of it anymore because uh, they're just exporting it and making money off of it and what's happening so i want to talk about the other side of it right so what's happening is yes they're getting a decent amount of money and a certain amount of money is flowing in but what's happening is the fields that they were that they're using because of the ancient system of land management that they were using right the, the quality of the fields are deteriorating which means that they've got to use more non traditional sources of fertility to put into the ground which means that you're having quality issues you know with your with your manure with your fertilizer etc which means that you're altering the land you're altering the chemical composition the biological composition of the land and and so on and so forth and you know people have noted that now 
the place that came up with quinoa that that domesticated quinoa 5000 years ago does not grow anywhere near the best quality of quinoa because the land just isn't good enough to support it and so this super food has super sort of really ruined an entire culture and it's a great and i don't mean great in like a nice way but it's a great example of how the fads that we have these super food fads which come on you know think about it you don't buy it i don't buy it let me put it this way all foods eaten in the right sort of mixture uh in the right proportions uh eaten uh, uh you know at the appropriate time and in the appropriate quantities are good foods right you must get a good mix of nutrients and that really is what food is for energy and nutrients and this whole superfood story has taken off it has devastated indigenous communities right but what it's also done is it's created a globalized web of energy inefficient food production and food consumption that is entirely unnecessary and you know what i again i mean i love a, you know a, a really good sort of italian cheese i love i love soba uh, there's a lot of stuff i love which which are regional specialties or whatever you want to call them right i'm not dissing the idea that we should be able to try what the rest of the world is having i love that exploration and and culinary exploration is great but we've got to have a look at the impacts that our fads have and so i'm going to leave you with a story since we're talking about impact from about 2000 years ago the ancient romans were known to be a hard partying lot the whole concept of the orgy has come from them you know the idea that they would all sit and have a huge party where they would eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and then they take an emetic purge their stomachs come back and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat some more and some of the things the romans ate i mean you knew that these guys were bored with like the regular stuff and they wanted some amazing you know hippos and flamingos sort of stories right anyway so the ancient romans were hard partying and obviously uh in contrast to mr john of cereal box fame of cornflakes fame they enjoyed their roges and being up for anything they did also though need to have a sort of safety net and what they what they had was this amazing safety net which was basically a plant that was a natural means of birth control and it was a plant called i think silphium and it grew in a certain area of north africa and the amazing thing is it only grew wild okay so you couldn't you couldn't domestic they couldn't domesticate the plant god knows they must have tried and they couldn't and their appetite for that plant was so great that the plant went extinct and we don't know what silphium looks like anymore we don't know we have a vague idea of of the plant uh, sort of family it was related to uh, but we have absolutely no clue what that plant is exactly we can't say with absolute certainty what it is because it's gone they consumed it out of exp- uh, uh, out of existence and the real story over there other than the lascivious lives of the romans the real story over there is about the impact that one civilization one city was able to make on an entire natural ecosystem just by excessive consumption and so now i guess what this knowledge of random useless facts of little pieces of somewhat forgotten history triggers in me is that every time i see uh, you know an ad or an article or a video about the next new superfood the my first thought is you know whose land is being taken whose crops are being grown whose culture is being appropriated it's a very tiring way of looking at the world and it's a very cynical way of looking at the world but i suspect if we have to um you know really enjoy our food sustainably uh, this is one of the many many ways we're going to have to rethink our food culture how we approach it and what a superfood really is because a is a superfood good for me as an individual uh you know us as a culture and of course this planet as a whole uh, and if we can sort of bring all of that together and look at indigenous systems of how food is such an intrinsic part of a big interlocking system of systems i think that will be the real f- superfood culture i think that's really where it'll make a real difference to all of our health in many many different ways 
Okay, enough sermonizing from me. Um, I guess we've all got like that bowl of kale salad or whatever to get back to uh, and healthy lives to live. <laughs> But um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, who knows what's happening next time. I suspect I'm going to tackle that drug lord empire story next time and uh, hopefully I'll have a guest on as well. So uh, subscribe, stay tuned uh, and see you soon. Happy Diwali by the way. <laughs>